good negotiator. Um, I've done one or two. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to talk about negotiation because uh, there's there's several reasons why I want to talk about it. The first one, and I'll give you a little case study to it, is um, I tried to negotiate before an offer to save time and protect time. So um, understanding that from a perspective of the, the right questions you ask and the things that you say may or may not get you the offer that you're looking for, but it may also save you tons of time because you didn't not say anything and then wait for an offer and then have to go in this downward spiral back hole of trying to go. Um, so preemptively creating terms and prevent uh, preemptively understanding who you're negotiating with is the key. Um, I will I will say that this, you know, Brad, Brad and more of the experienced real estate agents and or investors for that matter, um, when you just have a long history of experience, you always have those events in, that are replaying in your mind of like, I wish I would have done this differently. So now I'm going to do this differently. And um, so with negotiations and marketing, really, you do all this marketing to get a lead. And then from the point you get a lead and you have to start dialoguing with them, that's when negotiation becomes apparently uh, important to the where you navigate, how much time is invested in that lead, um, the questions you ask and understanding that person. So from a perspective of marketing, I try to I don't know if you guys are you guys familiar with disk assessments, DISC? So for some of you, this is the understanding of the four quadrants of different types of personality that you're going to deal with in everyday people. Um, it's the science of like a high D is somebody who is go, 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 uh, doesn't ask a lot of analytical questions, just wants to get the job done. That's going to be more of your entrepreneurs where a high I is going to be somebody who's and they're, they're always going to be asking questions and under trying to understand everything, but your, your S and your C's are, are broken down by, you know, is it data driven or proof driven? Um, or are people kind of preemptively always in the defense versus the offense of the conversation? So I hate using the disc assessment because realtors use it all the time, especially top producers into breaking and analyzing every single person down. So I typically, when I start to take that lead into negotiation or pre-offer phase, I tend to ask the right questions like, why are you looking to sell? Or what is the current situation, right? And trying to do as much fact finding as, as possible. But understanding the second motive of the fact finding is understanding what type of person this is. And that in itself is fact finding. So people's tone how short they are with you, uh, their intentions of what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, is it financial? Is it, is it a problem that they're trying to solve? But also looking at their mannerisms and looking at understanding their tone of the voice, as well as, uh, you know, what I call the friendly meter, like how friendly are they? Are they opening up to you or is it, is it pure business? So I wanted to kind of give you a couple examples of what I mean by this. Uh, there was somebody, we did a presentation for ROA, uh, Rental Owners Association. And then there's a couple of leads that came in, a couple of people that I knew they were just data hunting. They really weren't interested in using us as realtors. They weren't interested in doing anything, but picking our brain and then going applying it elsewhere. Um, and there was a lady who was like, yeah, I'm interested in selling, um, but I, I just got to get all my ducks in the row and then I'll reach back out, right? So weeks go by. Um, we follow up a few times, classic protocol. And then by the time we got her into a meeting, she's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm interested in selling these two properties. The one in Cottage Grove, I already have listed with an agent and I'm not interested in selling a duplex. So basically her game plan changed. We, we were like, okay, she's all over the place. Let's just figure out what she's trying to sell. And typically what people are trying to sell, just FYI, FYI across the board when they own a lot of properties is the things they're trying to sell are the ones that are shitty. Pardon my French. They're the ones that don't cash flow well, have bad tenant problems, 
they don't want to put a bunch of money into it because it has deferred maintenance um, or it's a bad location or lot, yada, yada, yada. So from a negotiation standpoint, automatically think they're selling me their crap. So we go to meet with this lady after multiple follow-ups. She finally has us meet. And the first thing that happens when we walk in the door of this single family house is there's a flooring contractor there doing flooring in a rental. Tenants are gone. In my head, as the negotiator, I said to myself, she's not going to sell this to us. Why would she be selling to an investor while she's trying to do the floors in that whole process? So being able to understand people and their motives and what they're doing set me up for the conversation of negotiating with her. And I just, just flat out, we went out to the deck. I was like, all right, I looked around. Um, I looked at the property. Just wanted to ask, uh, what do you, what are you trying to accomplish here? Are you interested in selling it to us or are you going to put it on the market? You know, straight up first question, like let's cut to the chase. Um, and in all of that, what I noticed with her and her mannerisms is that she was nervous. She wasn't looking us in the eye and the person that she had brought to the meeting was actually her real estate agent from a transaction in Cottage Grove that she didn't sell it to us. So long story short, she's there with a real estate agent talking to other two real estate agents and we're in the capacity of investors. So I noticed that she's not looking us in the eyes. She's not doing anything that would constitute a genuine conversation. And I just straight up asked her, said, why are you doing the floors if you called us over here to possibly purchase this property? It makes no sense. And she immediately got on the defensive. Oh, like, well, the floors needed to be done, blah, 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 blah. I was like, awesome. Second question. So what are you trying to sell this for? Did you run comps? Her response, no, I didn't run comps. Okay, so you just kicked out your tenants. You're putting 7K or 5K or 4K into putting in new floors. And you went into an investor meeting without running comps. And she said, no, I didn't run any comps. And I was like, awesome. So what do you want to sell this house for? And she says, 370,000. I said, wow, it sounds like you didn't run comps because this house is worth 240,000. And I just handed her a stack of papers and she started going through them. And I said, the numbers don't lie. What was recorded at escrow last week is what's in that stack of papers, price per square foot, and then the condition of your property, location. And long story short, I, I just basically broke it down to say, you want 370, the market wants 250 max. I said, well, before we get into even more of a conversation, why do you think it's worth 370? The market's hot was her response. I said, awesome. You're on a main road. You are in the worst crime neighborhood of the entire west side of Eugene. And what were people renting this house for? She's like, oh, they were renting it for 1400 bucks. I was like, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. Why would you kick your tenants out to sell it if you were at 1400 bucks? And she's like, oh, they didn't work out. So I want to sell it. Long story short, she invited me and Ed out there to ask us questions about owner financing so she could turn around and owner financing and had no intention of ever selling it to us. And I immediately caught it. Ed immediately starts talking about owner financing. I said, whoa, 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 Ed. Doesn't sound like we're going to come to an agreement here. You're at 370. The market's at 250. I'd rather have you give us a call when it doesn't sell. What I'm trying to get at is that we got back in our car and we took what would have been like a 30 to 40 minute conversation and I made it like 11 minutes. We got back in our car and left. And what I wanna say from an investor standpoint and as a real estate agent standpoint, what you gotta do them towards to maximize your effectiveness is not be best friends with people. 
when you're trying to get a deal done, you got to ask the right questions and understand their mannerisms and understand the negotiation strategy. But why I'm saying this is that this didn't even open up the spectrum of negotiations. We weren't even at negotiations. We were pre-discovery phase, understanding how serious she was, understanding any indicators that would say that she's not going to sell. And I sent her a text message like, hey, thank you again for meeting with us. We really appreciate it. And she went on a hunt for more information. Oh, it was great to meet you guys. Like, is there any more information you can send me about owner financing and this and this and that? And I was like, oh, no, yeah, perfect. It's called Google. And I sent her literally a Google link to uh, owner financing. So, yes, Brad. One of the major problems you had there was, number one, is the other realtor had to disclose to you that he represented her. Number Correct. one, he didn't do that. And right then is when you should have stopped anything because no. you're an F, you're got an ethical problem trying to solicit business from one client when she has a representative, even though maybe not that house. They it's did. Fine line. They did disclose it. She said she's representing me. Oh, okay. So why didn't that representative do comps? I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Long story short was, you're exactly right. She said, this is my representative. This is my yada, yada, yada. But the lady spoke the whole time. The realtor never said anything. We, we, under knew, we understood it was an information grab from day one. So what I'm trying to get at is when you go into the deal phase of writing an offer, that's purely, you're like a little computer. You've already computed, who am I dealing with? What's their motivation level? What type, of, uh, what type of indicators have they given me before I write this offer? And what questions should I proactively put in that cover email that they're probably gonna have when I write this offer? And the reason for this is that your entire strategy has to get into that offer. Getting it into the offer is the most important fact. If she would have said somewhere close to 250 to 275, I would have wrote her an offer. But there was no way of getting there because she had no intention in selling us the property. And I want to tell everybody, even if you're a wholesaler here, understanding that quickly will save you four or five phone calls, will save you two or three text messages, and will save you a visit there that they have no intention of selling. And when it's a hot market, the real estate agent is actually going to get the business before the wholesaler. As soon as the market goes neutral or it's probate, death or divorce or foreclosure, then the wholesaler is probably more on an even keel with the real estate agent. So first analyzing the, the preemptiveness of that conversation, understanding those and asking the right questions is key. And you guys are, I mean, Grace and Saffron, Kevin, all of you guys, You've been in multiple deals, so you've used that experience in the past to kind of ask the right questions to get to the conclusion of, is it worth my time to go out there and meet with this person? As soon as you do write an offer, okay, that's when the shift of the, the negotiation changes. So if you're a seller selling your investment property and you're FISBOing it or you're with a realtor, as soon as you accept the buyer's offer, the shift of negotiation now switches to the buyer. And that's where time management is key. Fast forward to this week, got an offer on the duplex. Can't disclose tons of information here, but I'll tell you that we countered. Before they countered, I sent a text message that basically said, there won't be another counter after this. I'm saving you, you time and my time. That's where it is. If you put this in contract and then it goes anywhere else, it's going to lead to a dead end. So just save your time and my time. And I'll just preemptively tell you that now. Guy never responded. That's exactly what I wanted. Because at the end of the day, I'm still getting calls. I'm still getting offers. So it's, it's, being able to set that precedent up front 
where you can't really say that stuff in the property copy. I mean, I've seen some variations of property copy that have said things like no lowball offers or price seller is firm on price. But when it comes to price terms and how you want to get the deal done, I think that time savings and that time protection is huge. Now, once you're in contract, you have to understand the drag of time. And what I mean by the drag of time, and I've made this up, this is something you can't Google. As you get dragged into the deal, so it doesn't matter if you're a buyer or a seller, as you get dragged farther into the deal, past inspections, or from inspections to repair addendums, to repair addendums, to appraisal, as you get sucked into the deal farther and farther, if you have to back out, it's not free. Your time has been wasted. Your time, time is money. And that's where you have to ultimately measure, am I willing to walk and go back on the market? Or am I willing to negotiate based upon the things that they have pointed out or they're asking for? And I think ultimately the velocity of the market, how hot it is, how cold it is, that asset class, what type of income it produces, uh, how much deferred maintenance is there. I always ask myself the one question in terms of negotiating while I'm dragged into the deal, what would a lender say? That's the first question you should always ask yourself, not what the buyer or seller is saying and anything in regard to that, or as I'm saying as an investor, what would a lender say if I sent this deal to them and said, would you approve it for this price? Because if you ask yourself that question, and that's a bigger investor told me to always ask myself that question, then you think like a lender would. Okay, income approach doesn't work. Okay, uh, sales comps doesn't work. Now, you understand, you ask yourself that question as you would get dragged into the deal before appraisal. So don't be shocked when the appraisal comes back and your buyer can't come up with the difference and or you guys can't negotiate and figure it out because the reason this is super important is that we're in a hot market right now. So people are pulling cash out above and beyond to appraise and, and make the deal happen. But as soon as this market becomes neutral or a buyer's market, there will be no money coming out of the buyer's back pocket to make the appraisal happen. It's gonna be the seller backing down and negotiating to get back to where it needs to be to appraise. Now, cash, as we all know, is king and, and you're not gonna have a lot of these problems when it comes to the appraisal. But I ultimately always tell everybody is the farther you get sucked into a deal, the more and more typically the buyer will make concessions. Like, oh, the, most of the repairs were done. It's all right. Just like get this thing over with. Like we want the property. Oh my God. I've heard that and it happened to me multiple times. Typically what you want to tell yourself though, is when you're negotiating in the offer phase, unless it's a big property, like deals that Brad's doing that's commercial and there's a lot of moving parts or a big, big apartment complex, I would not suggest going past a seller counter one, a addendum, basically a buyer counter one, and then maybe one more round. Once you get into like two or three rounds, I, me and Ed can contest to this, we've lost deals over $2,000. Why? Because a seller just got pissed off. Was like, oh, no, I want this amount of money down. We just offered you 3K less. I walked. And then they're on the market, sucked back into a whole new process. And at the end of the day, people don't understand that time is money. And if they would have just negotiated, they would have saved themselves $2,000 in time. So with all of this, one of the first things I wanted to really say is understanding what you compromise on from the beginning is the most important. Because at that level of first interaction, when somebody comes out of the gate, I, I remember, I think it was Lance or somebody that referred us a deal months back. 
And as soon as the person, when we went over to the house, as soon as they opened their mouth, like, I ain't going to give this property away. Like, if you think you're going to get some wholesale deal on this property, it's not going to happen. And I need, I, I think it's worth 265 and that's what it's worth because Zillow said it's worth that. And immediately, right? Like, okay, this person, price is all they care about. They're not going to be easy to negotiate with. So how do we, how do we address other pain points like logistics or moving or garage sales or family questions? or financially where she go from there. And those other points is what we're trying to negotiate on because we knew price was just like pretty much set in stone. There was meat on the bone, but at the end of the day, was it worth getting sucked into that deal if we would have never come to a price? So we drove out there again, we submitted our offer and I literally told her, in the front yard of her house, this is like four or five months ago, I said, what you want for this house is never going to happen. This is what we can give you for this house. I understand that you have multiple things that are going on here that you need to figure out, but I would say, call your daughter right now. And if you can't move in with her, then there is no deal. She calls her daughter. Her daughter's like, you're not moving in with me. She said, cool. There was no deal. We picked up our papers, we left, and we called her back like six months later and said, if you ever want to sell your house, we'd represent you as your real estate agent. That's it. So I just want to be clear here. The more desperate we get as investors, as inventory comes down, the more we tend to overlook negotiation. We tend to, hey, I just need a deal. Hey, I want to keep my contractor busy so it doesn't bounce off to somebody else that's an investor hey, I want to keep the marketing machine going. So I need to get like 10, 15K on a project just so I can keep the, the cash flow rolling. And negotiation goes out the door. And now there's been three or four projects now that we're getting SOS messages from that's like, hey, I'm in this project. I'm screwed. I'm upside down. Contractor's gone. And I bought the house for too much money. And I just wanted to say that that whole negotiation standpoint, the whole perspective of negotiation was clouded as soon as they walked into the property. I just need a deal. I just need a deal. I just need a deal. Just write an offer, write 40K over, write 50K over. There was a property out in Marcola. It was listed for 125. It sold for 175. There wasn't a comp 20 miles from it. The neighbors were camping with RVs and tents in their backyard. There was trash at the house next to it, not the way, place where they're camping. The house next to it, their whole entire backyard was filled with trash. So somebody literally $50,000 over asking on a property where the neighborhood's ARV was nowhere near it. And I just want to be very cautious in telling everybody, be very careful who is giving you advice on pricing and negotiating with sellers. Because I got four phone calls in the last two weeks, people in very bad situations with flipping houses. And it was all from ne not negotiating a good price or knowing when to walk. Don't offer. Write the offer of what it's supposed to be, not what it needs to be. So listening skills, understanding on how to be a psychologist to the deal and the person who's buying and selling, understanding that there is different phases of the deal are key to understanding when, what, and how you're going to get the deal done. And I think if you're not a hybrid investor that does a lot of both and you're just in real estate space, you're always looking for the maximized dollar, right? You're always looking for the best terms to get the deal won. You're always looking for the same things. But as soon as you put the investor hat on, you're like, whoa, it's almost the opposite. Like, how do I portray this property that it's not worth what it's supposed to be worth? Because I'll never have any profit. I'm buying profit. If I'm not buying at a 
at a price that's fair as an investor between you know 55 to 75 on the dollar, then I'm putting myself in a very sticky situation on the back end. So I have told everybody that I've ever gone through, one of the best trainings I ever got was becoming a certified real estate negotiation expert. Um, that was one of the first trainings I got as soon as I got my license. I had already got the training at the National Associations of Expert Advisors on negotiation because there's only three things people care about when you sell their property. How are you going to market it? How are you going to price it? And how are you going to negotiate it? Those three things, pricing, promotion, negotiation. And if you're not an expert on those three things, then you probably shouldn't be in this business as an investor or an agent. And I think ultimately, if you guys like have advice on commercial property, like Jen's brought up, like, hey, I'm not sure if anybody would like this property. That's perfect to always lean in on somebody who's got ex years of experience of all of these bad situations that have occurred because you're going to be able to help paint it in like a 10 minute conversation before you waste three hours on it or underwriting it or writing an offer and meeting with the seller. Call somebody that you can, you can lean on and say, hey, here's the deal. Like, what are the points to negotiate on? Like, what are the due diligence and the things I should be thinking about before I even get sucked into this deal? Because I, myself, I can, I can vet for Ed, we learned the hard way on a lot of the first deals we did because we didn't know what we were doing when it came to negotiations because we were in a market out of state. We didn't even know. Real estate agent saying one thing, my friends and other investors are saying another. And it's like, hey, just write, write at this. This is what we care about. This is the price and terms we care about. And at the end of the day, what happens is that you don't, you don't realize what you learn in terms of negotiations until deal after deal after deal after deal. You can't just learn it from a seminar. So that's ultimately what I wanted to focus on today because I think the pricing and the promotion and getting that lead into your, into your little ecosystem of follow-up um, is the difference between why a big investor is always taking down deals. And I'm not saying like Grant Cardone level, but when I look at smaller investors, there's this guy named Darren Batchelder, pretty good friends with him. He does a lot of multifamily in Texas and in the South. And he always talks about like, he's like, yeah, guys, like this seller had been getting letters for years. They had met with them three or four or five different investment groups. But the person who closes the deal is the person who walks in there super prepared, understands how to pivot, can play psychologist and addresses all their needs and be able to create the value proposition to understanding that. And that, I think even from a real estate agent's perspective, that's the hardest thing when you have an unrealistic seller that's like, oh, this is what I want for the house. Just list it, All right? So it doesn't matter if you're wholesaling, doesn't matter if you're house flipping, doesn't matter if you're holding, understanding <clears throat> income valuation, sales comp comps, cap rates, GRMs, what your cash on cash return is, what your, what your IRR is, all of the financial calculations of investments are imperative to walking into these properties. When you see a duplex in Eugene sell for 500 and a quarter with like $1,100 rents, it doesn't pencil. Like it's a cash purchase. Somebody's throwing it in their portfolio and they obviously don't understand that it would never appraise with a lender. And so asking yourself that lending question, what would a lender do? How do I position myself in the best light so I can explain that valuation? You don't know how many investors I talk to where it's like, yeah, we own one or two properties. I'm like, awesome. Like, what, it, what, are, what are the rents? And then they're like, oh, it's this. We're doing pretty good. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're actually losing money. Like, look at my phone. And then I'll show them like they're cash flowing $115. And they're like, 
wait, there's got to be something wrong. I'm like, no, this is exactly what a property management company would do. Like, these are your numbers. This is how much you're cash flowing. Well, that doesn't make sense. I'm making this much amount of money. Yeah, but you haven't put a roof on it in 30 years. You still have the same exact carpet. Right? Your, your, your tenants are paying you at 75 cents on the dollar. So last thing I'll say about this negotiation and putting this all together is that you don't get in this business to be in community service. If you want to give back and help your community, make the money off your deals and then donate it after you made your net profit. Give it back to the people, but don't get into this business to offer cheap rent because by the time it gets to me and Brad and everyone else that's a real estate agent and we're like, hey, just FYI, like the valuation of your property is X and you think it's Y and you've been like nice to these people, I get it, but you're ultimately screwing your kids. You basically just took 10 or $20 out of your kid's wallet for the last five years straight because now when you go to sell it and you're going to give that money to them anyways and they're going to inherit it, you just gave it back to your tenants. So separate being a landlord or being an investor from giving back and providing to your community. And I think people get mad at me when I say that, but I'm like, that is ultimately what you do. You create wealth and then you see what your net profit is and then you give it to people in need. You don't give it to people in need by not raising rents or not managing your asset properly. Don't be in the business if you're going to do that. So that's the reason I will say this. There is three or four portfolios for sale right now and they're sitting. There's three or four big portfolios on the market right now sitting because the net operating income and the valuation of those properties is completely wrong. And they're just waiting for somebody that did a bigger 1031 that needs to spend the money that needs to suck up some properties. So ultimately from a negotiation standpoint, it's being able to either negotiate as an investor and understanding that and being able to create that or from a real estate agent, being able to negotiate for yourself as you take a listing. And I'll tell you this guys, like when I take a listing, that's, more expensive, I'll, I'll tell them straight off the gate, like we'll list it for what you want. And when it doesn't sell, then I'll give you X amount of time. And then I'm cutting the umbilical cord and you can go sell yourself. So that's what I had today. Any questions about negotiations or anything or anybody has a funny story, Brad. So how do you negotiate as is on a piece of property? Nothing is as is. You're the one that taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody says it's as is, it means the negotiations are starting. Yes. Or if you have the opposite where somebody tells you it's as is or like we're not accepting low ball or whatever, I always just say, hey, we're open to dialogue. And at the end of the day, like let's, let's have a conversation about it. But when you go cold, or you just don't respond, like you had no intention of ever buying it for the price it was, you're just wasting my time. Um, and I think that's ultimately what takes, when I, before I was a broker and I was just an investor, I, I always used to ask myself like, why don't real estate agents ever get back to me? And then I was like, wait, now I'm a real estate agent. I know, understand like who are, they're always measuring who's a time waster versus who's real and who's going to be a repeat client and who's going to be able to provide value or, or be able to, and it's, guys, it has nothing to do with just them being greedy. Go ask an electrician to go change a GFI at your house if you're not best friends. They're going to be like, go YouTube it. Like, stop calling me. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, hey, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I wanted yeah. to ask uh, about this little gesture that you and Brad had, Dan, about um, the negotiations are just beginning with the for sale as is. Is that what you're saying? Yep. It's for sale as is. Tell me more about what you think in there. Yeah. So and I, Brad can uh, Brad can chime on in this. We, we see a lot of this with flips and a lot of this with uh, properties super deferred, especially in probate because the family, like they're liquidating 
and they don't want any repair addendums and negotiations. Like they basically told the listing agent, like we want 175 and I, I'm not negotiating anything underneath that. And I lost, I lost a big deal uh, for another investor over off somewhere in Eugene uh, off Coburg because it was that exact scenario. They like took a lower offer that was a, uh, inspection for informational purposes only is what I lost that deal on that exact sentences. So with as is, it really all depends on the velocity of the market. So what I tell everybody is if you got 10 or 15 house flippers all at the same two days looking at a house, then you know, as is, is really not a negotiation because you know the velocity of the market it has tons of views. There's tons of saves on Zillow. There's a lot of people looking at it. There's been a lot of action. You call the listing agent like, hey, how many offers you have? Or you get a lot of people showing, oh man, dude, the lockbox has been going on and off all day. But guys, like what, three years ago, three to three and a half years ago, there was property sitting on the market. And it says as is, I mean, I know, I know Brad has got a threshold of how under asking he likes to write. I also have some threshold of under asking I write. But even with my own personal house, like needed work. I knew he did a lot of shoddy construction or cut some corners. I was like, Brad, write him an offer at 250. It's 19,000 under. We'll see what he says. And that agent said this was as is. Yep. So we've, <laughs> if that doesn't prove to you that it's not as is, that's, that's kind of how I break it down. So one of the places as is comes into when you're buying or selling a house. So you, you, you're, you're representing the buyer and the, and the seller's going, it's as is, but in your contract. And it says, you know, may say as is, but there's too many variables. So when a person tells me it's as is, it just means we're going to start negotiating. And I've yet to ever had anybody give up because we didn't negotiate for repairs or price. Once you, once you got their signature on a, on a sales contract, then it's a different story than, than before you have some kind of a base agreement. So in your case, we made a low ball offer and they took it. But in the case of a normal house, say I paid $300,000 for a house or made an offer, the buyer or the seller accepts the buyer's offer. We do an, we do a repair or, you know, an inspection, needs repairs. I don't care if it says as is, sellers just do not back out unless it's unreasonable. And sometimes they're very unreasonable. It can be a big dollar thing like a roof. And then you could, you tell that seller, well, you know, you don't want to put a roof on it, but you're not going to sell it because it won't finance. Yep. And I, he just said something that everyone should understand is that, that, that there's like a threshold and like all of the logical thinking of assessing a property. There's that, you know, what would a lender say question you always should ask yourself. But then the second question is like, what is that threshold of like, what, what would a lender get stuck on this? or even a hard money lender. Like it's, it's not so much just conventional VA and FHA where it's getting even more uh, nitty gritty on what the things, but when you're looking at this from a hard lender's perspective, right? You got, what you got to understand is yes, they may still finance the deal, but they may actually kick up your interest rate one or 2% or lower your term, or there might be some fluctuations in the, in the actual vehicle of how that is accessed. And I, I've literally seen that there was a nine unit apartment complex that we put an offer on. And uh, the guy was like, oh, great price. Everything's great. Until the inspection came back. He's like, I want to see the inspection. One of the few times I've seen a lender ask that. Yes. I want to tell a little story I had on our very first flip. Uh, the hard money lender actually did not think the house would sell for what we thought it would sell for so they made us kick more money in or as a down payment well it turned out we were right and they were wrong but they still you know because they did not think that the house would 
sell for that. That was uh, almost four years ago, so times have changed. But I also yeah. want to say I, I, I'm a firm believer in no deal is better than a bad deal. Yeah. I see a lot of people overpaying for shit that I'm surprised. And I'm like, well, let them take it in the ass. Better them than me. Yeah. You know, they're paying way too much for this thing. And, you know, we, we went into a, we just barely missed out on one in Junction City from, from a uh, wholesaler. And it's just like, you got to know when to say no, when, when enough is enough. The, the best deals you'll ever do are the deals you don't do. Right. That's, <laughs> yeah, I and think I, so. And I think uh, like when I teach, uh, when I teach, like I have a couple like friends that are agents that want to get into investing or they're, I, I always get the common call like, hey, I want to get into a wholesaling. And I'm like, well, wait, it's not just wholesaling you should get into. You should understand how to be an investor. Mm-hmm. Regardless if you just, you can't just study wholesaling. You got to understand everything from an investment standpoint. And I always say, what you got to understand is that what you may lock that into a contract. And what happens is that your buyer that bought it from you, he's going to, you're going to lead him into a tunnel of mass destruction. And then your credibility with him, who is probably somebody who potentially could be a multiple, you know, repeat customer for you as a whole, the best wholesalers have the best valuations and honest ARVs. But when I see mm-hmm. some of these that come across my email, and I'm like, 32,000 in repairs. Yeah, right. I, yes. It, it, it just, now you're, you slide yourself into that category of wholesaling. And I, guys, I'm not against wholesaling, but what I am against is there's no regulation of wholesaling. There should be some governing body that sets some sort of cowboy rules for wholesaling in each state. The other thing is. I don't know about a governing body, but. Yeah, you we're kicking that. you off, Dan. You're out of here. <laughs> no. The best <laughs> wholesalers we've worked with are teachable. And when they sent yeah. us a deal that their numbers were completely off, they actually called me and said, what do you think the numbers should be? And I told them why. I thought the numbers should be adjusted. Exactly why. And the next day they sent out the offer again with the numbers I gave them. They were teachable. And those are the guys that we've done the most business with because they are teachable and they are willing to go back and renegotiate and do it right. And they're good yeah, at I renegotiating. No, I know. Oh, yeah. I have no problem going back if I get better feedback from people. So, yeah. There you go. I, agree. I do have news for everybody in the negotiation of wholesaling deals. Oh, no. It, it will not be around in the next five to seven years. Why is that? Assigning contracts is taking inventory away from real estate agents. Mm-hmm. And, so and the NAR state, is going to go after it? It already is. They, are, already they have been Illinois. for years. They've been doing that for decades, trying to go after it. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So long story short is, is it's kind of like syndication. Uh, attorneys stop dealing with it. Escrow companies say we don't do wholesale deals. And we're already starting. I know two escrow companies that used to do them that don't do them anymore. Well, I know two that still do them. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that to scare anybody. What I'm saying is that uh, as an investor and an agent, like I could care less. I would wholesale something if I can. But the brokerages are starting to crack down on no wholesaling to the agents. And so that's the first time oh, to the that I've agent. ever... Yeah. And cracking down on it. I know a guy in Portland that basically got kicked out of a brokerage for it. Hmm. So I think what's happening is just understanding the assignability. um, And what will happen is it's not really the NAR that's going to change it. It's going to be the contractual code of the state. It can only be assigned for a trans intercompany transfer LLC or a developer moving it to another LLC that he owns. The real reason why contracts are assignable is to move it in trust issues or move it to another LLC in your shell or to move it to a syndication fund. 
I'm not sitting here arguing about wholesaling. I'm saying that was the real reason why contracts were assignable. So that from a legal Take advantage of them while you can. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. <laughs> my, be, my best friend and roommate from college is a real estate attorney. Really? He just called me like a half hour before this call. So he was just saying like, just FYI, that's originally why a signing was, was created in the whole sequence of things. And it's a matter of time before that catches up. So can, get it while you can. I, is one. I'd love to, can I just, hi, I'm Gail, by the way. Um, can I, hi, can I back up just a minute about what you were talking about? with, um, I'm a real estate agent in Bend. And yep. it's so interesting right now. I, I can't imagine how flippers are able in this market to even get involved. And I have some rental properties myself, but like, I would think that people should just wait at this point because it's so crazy. In fact, I've had some listings recently that shocks me. These are cat, cash buyers coming in and putting 30, 40,000 over, over our asking price. And there's no other offers on the table. I can't imagine why someone with cash would not first call the agent and say, well, how many offers do you have? If we have none, why not do asking price? Why are you <laughs> yeah. doing thir And what's interesting about that is, you know, 30, 40,000 over and with cash, there's no appraisal, right? So that's actually bringing the market up in that neighborhood, frankly. Um, but we were seriously talking about had we gotten an offer 30 to 40,000 over, it probably would not have appraised because I pulled all the comps. I did all that kind of stuff where you're like, I don't think it's going to appraise, but this cash buyers are coming in and just jacking the market up kind of weirdly. Um, anyway. So oh. I would think it's a hard thing for flippers right now to kind of get in to beat that kind of thing. It's you uh, you brought up a great point. And that's been, I, I mean, I feel for people who have like just a house flipping operation. A lot of the construction companies have had an arm that have been doing it right. Like kind of in-house uh, subsidiarily. Um, they've been the ones that have been most effective at doing this through this whole, cause they got remodeling work and their construction business is busy. So they can make a smaller and smaller margin because their their other business is kind of offset by that. Um, but who knows? It's, it's the rolling of the dice, guys. It's like going to a casino. So let's. It's eight o'clock, but I just want to say yeah. um, to Gail, um, let's talk distressed properties. When that's what us flippers and wholesalers are after is distressed properties, and whether it's because they need to get out of it fast they want to get rid of it because it has tenants in it and there's a moratorium that they can't get rid of it and they're paying way under rent rate or they live out of state and they can't get anywhere they can't deal with the you know something that's a thousand miles away um uh there's a death in the family you know uh, divorce all this kind of stuff where they need to sell it fast and that's where we come in as wholesalers and flippers people that can pay cash and, and, and bend is is an icon area for you know the whole nation right now <laughs> to say it is the hottest market but um there there is a there is a market for wholesalers and flippers and stuff like that. It's just finding those deals, finding those people and letting them know that we can help them get out of it fast. Um, I'm just gonna go back to something Dan said earlier when he was talking about negotiation in the beginning. My my um, my thoughts are always on this is that I pre-qualify the lead. I pre-qualify to, to make sure that this person is the person I need to talk to and that, and that they have a reason for me to talk to them or you know, that's, and, yeah, and that's smart. And then what, what is their problem? I want to find out what their problem is. And can I solve their problem? Am I the person to solve their problem? Or is it a better? <laughs> is there a better solution such as listing it? And I that and I will tell them up front. Yeah, you know, if if I'm not, if they don't need to sell it fast, if they don't need to get the hell out of Dodge, you know, that's usually, they, you know, then, then list it, you know, if, if they don't mind people coming through their house, 
and all that kind of stuff and, and cleaning it up some, then list it. But there's many people, hoarders, for example, that don't want people in their house and they need to get out, you know, yeah. or they inherited a, a hoarder's house and that kind of stuff. So there is room for us. But I get what you're saying, Gail, that people, cash buyers, probably from the Bay Area, bringing in money. Yeah. And oh, not even asking the agent yeah. if there is another offer. Well, and the thing is, I mean, I, to I think I told you this, but I'm licensed also Florida and Oregon. And it was right. so weird to see in Florida, there's so many homes, so re like, you know, 30,000, 40,000, like stick, like a block built brick homes that um, you can, that so flippers, like I feel like in certain other areas have so much more, you know, more access than like Bend Redmond. I'm not saying they're not around. It's just oh, yeah. interesting that yeah. in Florida, it's like, it, it it's a lot, you know, easy, easier to find those things. But I have to tell you this funny story. I had a, a distressed property. A woman called me speaking of hoarders and her daughter basically uh, she was elderly and her had her daughter move in to kind of like take care, help take care of her. Her daughter said, I'll help take care of you. Just put me on the, you know, put me on the, she owned the home free and clear. Oh, just put me on the deed and I'll, I'll move in and help you. <laughs> well, she ended up locking her out of the house. She lived in a shed, but the funny part about the whole story is this That's woman, the funny. daughter, no, I mean, it's not funny, but I mean, she's <laughs> fine. And, and now we're dealing with it. But the interesting thing is, speaking of hoarders, the, when I got the call from the, the mother, she'd gotten the house back. She had to go to court her, after her daughter had kicked her out of the house. She made her live in a shed for a year. We, we came back in the house and she said, I want you to help me list this home. Now, chickens lived in the back bedroom ducks had a pathway through the house there were there was one pathway where ducks lived in the house so she said to me do you, you know how much is the house worth like she wanted to you know know how much the house is worth and then we stepped outside and we almost sunk into the ground and she's like oh yeah all oh, the septic collapsed a while ago and so speaking of but this home was in an amazing area, like right on the edge of, like in the urban growth boundary on some acreage, the home was really worth a lot, but it was one of those moments where you're like, I didn't know chickens lived in the house. I didn't know ducks lived in the house, but it was a mess. And um, anyway, yeah. So we do see hoarding houses here in Bend. So what you're <laughs> saying Redmond. that is that there are mentally ill people in Bend as well, so. <laughs> Well, yeah, yes. and I didn't mean to make it sound that like it was a funny story, but yeah, um, it turned out with a happy ending. Oh, did it? Did like, it tell us that. Well, I'll say as a flipper, you know, since Saffron and I flip houses, yes, right now is a challenging time to find a project, but you know, I'd rather write it out than do it something silly. You know, people are paying silly prices right now, and as far as I'm concerned, I look at them as one less competitor in the year a couple years down the road when they take it take a dump on this project or barely make anything on it you know and work their tail off to do it okay. they'll say wow i tried flipping houses and i didn't make jack shit on it well hey, yeah of course not not at the prices you paid <laughs> and so you know it's okay by me so I have, you know, this is a long-term game. This isn't a short-term game. Real estate's a long-term investment. Whether you buy and hold, whether you flip, I don't care what you're doing. It's a long, it's not a short-term get rich quick scheme. You know, right. if you want to get rich quick, buy a lottery ticket. Yep. <laughs> no, it's you're hundred percent correct. I have a one o'clock or two o'clock meeting tomorrow that just came on my calendar at like five o'clock house flipper under underwater uh -huh. yeah. I, so it's yeah sad well um i sent out a few people uh, and i'm gonna tell you now in case you 
Dan, I know I sent it to you, Saffron, I sent it to you. Jens, I didn't send it to you, but everybody here, if you are interested in being at my Southtown Rotary meeting at noon on Thursday, I'm the presenter for 25 minute presentation. And I'm gonna be telling my fellow Rotarians about Oregon RIA and what we do and why we do it and, and what it's all about. So, and I'm gonna- Is it Zoom? It's a Zoom, it's a Zoom. <laughs> And I'll send the link out. Thursday. What's that? Yeah, I think I can do it Thursday yeah. if it's before one. Yeah. Yeah, it's it. My my speech time will be like twelve thirty to twelve fifty five. Okay. Right my up. brother's in town. I don't know. We'll see. I haven't seen my brother in a year and a half. So. Does he look like you? I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. He looks more like a skinny bald dude. He looks more like your dad, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not even him. Not even like Kevin's mother's father oh Kevin really? looks exactly like his mother who doesn't resemble her father at all interesting interesting i'll be sending no, out sorry, my brother an invite to all the all the members who would like to be there and be present and just and i'm going to do the haves and wants and during the haves and wants i'm going to just ask people that are there from the ria to just tell about their their experience being with the ria instead of doing the haves and wants kind of thing but yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. It'll, be, it'll be fun Anyways, thank you awesome. very much, Dan. Great, great yeah. presentation. And I just want to like summarize this whole thing up that negotiations is part of sales and our negotiations is buying so that we can get the product to sell and sales is part of marketing. It's all part of marketing. So there you go. One big thank network. You Dan. Thank, you, Dan. Yeah. thank you, Dan. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Aloha. Dan. Whoa. Aloha, Tony. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Aloha. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Tony comes from, to us from Hawaii, our new second newest member. <laughs> Welcome, Tony. We're Thank so you. happy Thank to you have for you. having me. <laughs> I learned Aloha. a lot. Can't wait to meet you in person. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I'll see you All soon. Right. Sounds good. Bye. Good night. Bye.